Now, these are the words of Jesus, right? He himself said, it's to our benefit, it's to our advantage that he goes. Hello, my friend. Jesus said, if we embrace the truth, the truth will release true freedom in our lives. I'm Dylan Bortis. Come join me as we discover the truth. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pastor Yarwe, and for tonight's or today's sermon, the title of my sermon is called The Fate to Continue. The Fate to Continue. Our focus scripture is found in Luke chapter 8. I'll be reading from verse 23. Correction, verse 43. And it reads as follows. And a woman was there who had been subjected to bleeding for 12 years. No one could heal her. She came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Shall we pray for the word? Heavenly Father, as I'm about to minister to your word, Lord, I pray, Lord, that as I decrease, that you might increase. I pray, Lord, for open hearts and alert minds. Above all, Lord, I pray, Lord, that your will be done as I minister this word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, this is a very familiar story to a lot of us. You've either heard it in Sunday school, preached by your local pastor in church, or maybe you've even read it yourself. It is a story about the woman who had a, a sickness, an illness for 12 years, who had exhausted the resources and tried various remedies, but still was not cured. No doctor could heal her. No psychologist could counsel her. No philosopher offered her direction. No amount of money seemed sufficient to solve her problem. She had tried and done it all. And after having tried and done it all, it still was not good enough. This woman's name is also not mentioned in the passage. But the story, her issue, became the talk of the town. Many of you is just like this woman. A lot of people know more about your issue than they do your story and your background. And what hurt even more is that other people was pulling it down while she was already at the low place because of her condition. And we often hear that choose your battles wisely, but what happens when the battle chooses you? This woman was paralyzed and a prisoner to a problem she never asked for, looked for, much less wanted. And her condition was not just physical, but it disqualified her from being a mother, being married, and participating in the religious life of the rest of the community. She was discriminated, disappointed, and disconnected. She was cursed by her condition and society. No one wanted to be seen with her, talk to her, much less even touch her. Failure had seemed to plague her. Failure had seemed to become a norm as she was there for far too long. And when you've been in a place for far too long, you either become comfortable and you learn to accept it as your normal, or you become desperate for a breakthrough. Now, there are several lessons that we can learn from a story, but for today's sermon, I just want to touch on a few. And the first lesson that we learn from her story is she had to believe that it's possible. 
despite how bad the circumstances look like, despite how many years she was there, despite who had given up on her and walked out of her life, she had to believe that it's still possible for her to be healed. If you are alive today, I want to encourage you. Don't allow your, dest your history to keep you away from your destiny. It is still possible for you to start that business. It is still possible for you to achieve that degree. It is still possible for you to find love again. It is possible. If God can do it for Joseph in a prison, if he can do it for Job with affliction, for Sarah with the barren womb, for the disciples in the storm, and for this woman when a situation looked hopeless and forgotten, believe me when I say he can still do it for you. It is possible. The second lesson we can learn from this woman is that she had to seize the moment. She had to seize the moment. Without seizing the moment, without taking action and seizing the moment, the miracle would have never occurred. A once in a lifetime opportunity must be seized in the moment that it's presented to you. So stop making excuses or downplaying its importance in your life. When heaven presents you with a window of opportunity for you to step out of your wilderness and into the promises of God, you need to step into it with boldness and don't hold back. Jesus was not even on his way to her, but he was on his way to heal somebody else, Jairus' daughter. But she had enough sense to recognize her divine appointment, her Kairos moment, her turning point. Frankly, she was sick and tired of being the outcast and repeatedly overlooked. She was either going to seize the moment or let it slip by her. What you must also understand is that the crowd that was pressing in towards Jesus were all presented with the same opportunity to receive something they never had before. But how they all both engaged the moment determined what they received. That's why everybody can show up for the same class, listen to the same message, exposed to the same opportunity, but those who show up differently in their attitude, their self-discipline, their commitment and focus will have a significantly different outcome. That's why you shouldn't minimize some moments in your life, although other people around you might have a casual attitude about it. Because you know the moment has the potential to significantly change things for your favor if stewarded correctly. It doesn't matter how bad your history, how many times you might have failed or who walked out of your life. Fully seize the moment and step into your new season with boldness. The third lesson that we learn out of the story is that this woman had to take the risk. Often because of past failures, it has stopped us from trying again because of fear that we might fail again. But we have to be willing to try again. Because sometimes what if God is using your failures as the foundation to your future success? What if God is using your failures that you might currently be experiencing as part of the process in order to mold your character. But you must be willing to take the risk and try. And even if you get to sink like Peter, while you 
in the midst of experiencing something extraordinary. At least you know how it feels like to walk on water while other people never got out of the boat. For this woman to touch Jesus' garment, to pe- push through the crowd, she had to be courageous and take the risk. She had to literally assume a military leopard crawl position and do it without exposing herself. Because according to Levitical law, a woman with her condition was considered unclean. And because she was considered unclean, she was forbidden by law to touch anybody because she could contaminate them. And she could be stoned to death because of their offense. So this was a dangerous mission for this woman to embark on in the first place. This was literally suicide. It was a dilemma in the midst of her drama. But she had made up her mind and she decided to take the risk. She knew that if she was not going to get healed today, she might never be free. She pressed in and pushed through the crowd and finally broke through, stretched out her hands and touched the hem of his garment and power was released and healing was received. The cure the doctor couldn't give her, the emotional stability the psychologist couldn't give her, the direction the philosopher couldn't offer, The desire for relationship her community community deprived her of. The resources she kept on losing because everything she got she lost. Jesus fixes in one moment when he heals her. He fixes it in one moment. The fourth lesson that we can learn out of this woman's story. We learn the significance of our decisions and the impact it has on the next generation. Now this woman had the issue of blood for 12 years. And 12 is a very significant number in the Bible. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples, 12 in biblical numerology is the number significant for governance. God wants to restore the governing order in your life. What is also interesting in the story is that her story meets at an interesting intersection of Jairus' daughter who now falls sick at the age of 12. And what you must also realize is that in Jewish tradition, the number 12 for girls is the year of their bar mitzvah. And for boy, bed mitzvah is 13. It's the time where they go from puberty and into woman and manhood. And that word literally translates into son and daughter of the commandment. So it's the time where they make the crucial transition into womanhood and manhood, and they were now responsible. And they would now be taught the commandments of God. Also, it would be the older women's and men's responsibility to teach them, to train them. And here, as this woman, this lady, as she is about to make the crucial transition from one season into womanhood, the devil takes her out. The devil is not fighting where you are at now. He's fighting the potential of what you could become. Moreover, it will be the woman's, older woman's responsibility to train the ladies that now become women when they are 12. But you must realize also from the story is that uh, uh, this lady, this daughter is 12 years old, meaning This woman with the issue of blood, her condition started when this lady was born. But here now God intervenes 
and he saves one generation, the woman with the issue of blood, the existing generation. He heals her before he heals Jairus' daughter so that there would be a woman to train Jairus' daughter. You think it is just about you when God has a generation in mind. Every Timothy needs a Paul. Every Joshua needs a Moses. Every David needs a Samuel. And every Esther needs a Mordecai. Every daughter, young daughter would need a woman to train her. That's why you have to make it because their future is greatly dependent on your future, on you becoming whole, you being saved and fulfilling your destiny. Have you ever noticed that once you're going in the way and doing nothing, the enemy doesn't worry or bother that much about you? But the moment you start walking according to the destiny and start doing what God has called you to do, you feel or you experience the fiercest threats upon your life. And also, often those that is not doing anything with their life and not going anywhere often fights you the most. But it's not just about you, but because God knows if you make it, you could be a blessing to the next generation. That's why your decisions you make, you must weigh them carefully. Because the decisions you make now affects the next generation. The people that will count on you and the people that will look to you. It is not just about you. The fight that you have to overcome, it's not just about you. But it's about those that God wants to bless through your life. Before I come to the final lesson, I just want to recap the first four. The first lesson that we learn from this story about this woman is that she had to believe that it's possible for her to be healed. She had to believe that despite everything, that it's still possible for her to be healed. Let's just hit recap. Number one, we learned from the story that this woman, she had to believe it's possible. She had to believe that it's possible despite how bad the circumstances looked like and how long she was there. She had to seize the moment because without her taking action and seizing the moment, the miracle would have never occurred. Number three, she had to take the risk. She had to be courageous and she had to take the risk. Number four, she had to realize that the decision is not just about her or her making it is not just about her, but because God has the next generation in mind and you have to make it in order to be a blessing to others. You have to make it in order to be a blessing to others. Study the lives of any great man from all walks of life, whether in academics, in business, or in politics. The ones who make it and the ones who achieve greatness is not because they're an easy road or because they have abundance of resources or because they never failed but because they had resilience and kept on going despite how many times they may have experienced setback. That's why it's crucial that you have to make it because God has a next generation in mind. The final lesson I would like to get to is 
that this woman had to have the faith to continue. Now, 12 years, she walked around with this issue. For 12 years, she had to deal with the psychological and emotional burden of being unwanted, unloved, and untouched. For 12 years, her issue persisted. And she could have given up a long time ago. In all honesty, I wouldn't blame her, but she had the fate to continue. Her fate might have been misguided and not perfect, but here's the thing, the main point is that she had it. She had no connections, no status, and no resources, but what she did have was her faith. What if what God wants to do next in your life is requiring your bold faith? This woman's response was not a ritual. It was spontaneous. She may have lost a lot of things along the way, but she holds on to hope. And when she saw Jesus that healed the blind, fed the multitude, and resurrected the dead, that hope activated her faith. And the faith that this woman had was uncommon. Her faith was pure. It was raw. It was refined in the finery of disappointment. It was the have no choice but to work faith. Her faith pushed the boundaries, challenged the conventional, upset the religious, tapped into the supernatural, Seize the moment and change the atmosphere. The faith that this woman had actually exuded an aroma. You could smell it through your nostrils, taste it on your lips, and feel its stingly sensation on your fingertips. It was miracle working, mountain moving faith. It might not have been practical, but it was radical faith. It was radical faith. If there's a resounding lesson that we can take away from this woman's life, it is this. is that when all hell breaks loose in your life, where you have mo- when you have more failures than victories, and you have every reason to quit, just continue. All this woman wanted was to be healed. It was nothing extravagant. It was not for a fancy new car or big house. It was just to be healed. And sometimes people want to judge you and say, oh, he should just be content and at peace with where he or she is when they know nothing about the difficult battles that you had to fight. And that it's just a miracle that you are still even alive. And you are living testimony because despite all of the turbulence in your life, you didn't quit and continue. I want to tell you today that I feel you. When your only miracle might be that you have enough petrol to survive the whole month through, or that God will carry you through another difficult month, for your husband to stop abusing you, or be saved, or for God to heal your broken heart. I feel you. And I want to say, don't stop. Continue. Continue although your circumstances might look contrary. Continue when every door you knock on is being closed. Continue when everybody around you is being blessed but you. It is not the fittest soldiers that survive 
or the best marriages that last, but those who has the resilience to continue. Some people missed out on open doors and yeses or developing above certain levels because they stopped halfway. But if you can just continue, despite everything, despite all the difficulties that you might be facing, if you can just continue, you can make it. Continue. Continue to have faith. Continue to try again. Continue to pray. Continue to take the risk. Continue when it's hard. Continue because somebody out there is counting on you not to give up but to pull through. Continue because you might be the hope that somebody is looking for. Continue because you making it might impact the next generation. Continue because God wants to use you as a blessing in other people's life. Continue because if you can just learn, keep your head up. Refuse to be distracted by the turbulence in your life and just continue. Then what you are currently struggling with will be behind you. And you would be in front of it. If you just learn to continue. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Come and join me next week.